trying to minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. And in other words, best to explain the data that you give it to the least squares model. PCA does exactly the same thing. Fitting a model to that matrix X by calculating the scores in the lower X. Okay. So overfitting occurs when you fit more components than are really supported by the data. You do the same thing as we saw there before the break. You're starting to fit more components. You're going to create basically a, a, a model plane that really is too high in dimensions for the data. So that in the future when you use the PCA model to make predictions, you're going to get the equivalent of let's say this rate curve. If you've got too many components, yes, your model fits the data that you built them um, built uh, your model with. But in the future if you want to use that model on new data, so here's my new data coming in as these squares. That red curve, which went all the way down here, is going to really not be a good prediction for that future testing data point. Same concept holds for PCA. So we're asking ourselves, when do we stop adding components? Now, one way people do that is by looking at the R squared value. Okay? So let's take a look at what happens here. I'm fitting my first components, I get an R squared of 55%. I fit my second component, I get 15% R squared. So the cumulative R squared is somewhere up around 70%. Add a third component, I get an additional 10. So that takes me to a total R squared of 80. And I can keep going until I add as many components as possible. And the maximum number of components you can add is a smaller of n or k. So usually you've got data sets with many more rows than columns, so usually the maximum number of components you can fit is the same as the number of columns that you have. Okay. But if you do have a short fat matrix, the maximum number of components you can fit then is n. So if you can keep going and add component after component, your R squared will always be a number above zero, implying that your cumulative R squared will keep growing and growing and growing until you reach this bound, at which point your R squared will equal 100%. Okay, you fit all your data to, to with that model. Now, what some people do is they look at this plot and they say, well, I'm gonna stop after I get diminishing returns. So there's diminishing returns in adding new components after, say, about the fourth component in this case, I'd say. Okay, so if you look for some kind of breakpoint in the plot, you can stop after one or four components. Really, it's not a clear answer where you should stop. So some people will do that. And that's been shown to be a poor way of predicting it. For one, we're not very good at telling where that where to stop along here is. Um, it's not always very clear where you start getting diminishing returns. But there's another important reason, um, or another way of, sorry, that people will try to stop adding. And that's, they'll stop adding components when, let's say, they get to 90% R squared. So they're saying, my model is good as long as R squared is 90%. Okay. Does that sound like something that you've done in the past? Because you've got a least squares model and you keep trying to add terms, or you so I'm going to take a log transform and maybe add a quadratic term to my model. And yay, look, my R squared is now up at 95%. I've got a good model. Okay, who's done that before? Yeah. Right. Several people, and every undergraduate lab report has something like that in it. Okay, that's really bad, and it's, and it's not warranted. And this, this holds in general. Okay? I mean, there's a, the reason for it um, is, is, is quite easy to explain. Let's take a look. If I'm fitting a model, draw a picture here. I'm fitting a model and I'm taking 
one or more x variables to predict some y. When I fit my model, I take my y's and my x's and I build a relationship between them. If I'm aiming for a certain r squared, r squared in this case says I'm able to predict this y with high accuracy. A high r squared, I can do a good job of predicting that y. But you need to ask yourself, how much error is in this y value? How much of this y you had to plot it over here, how much of that is signal and how much of it is noise? So let's say my first observation is over there, is y. That's the true value, which I never measure in practice. In practice, there's always some sort of error around that y. Okay. So there's some sort of error bar that you can draw. We might measure, though, our actual measurement that we record from our experiment or however we record this y value could be that value over there. Okay, it's somewhere within that error bar range. Then I take my next y, so this is observation one, observation two. It's got that same level of error and I measure my y over there. Then observation three and it's over here, let's say, with its y value, and I measure the corresponding y. So somewhere in that range is what the actual value that I'm going to build my model from. This open circle might represent the true value I would have measured if I had perfect instruments and ideal conditions, and I had, if I was God, basically. So the red value is what I'm really measuring. The open circle is the true unknown value. You can go calculate all these, all these y's, and that range then really represents the error in your y. Now, if you go and fit to a certain r squared value, and often people choose that to be really high, like in the order of 90 to 95, even as high as 98%, people keep adding components or keep adding terms to their model until they reach this really high r squared. But they've not really thought about it in the context of how much noise is there in my data that I'm actually fitting? If my raw data, let's say there's my true value, had really tiny error bars, then sure, going to aim for this high level of prediction would be fine. But if my y value was here and I had huge error bars, and I take a sample anywhere in that range, obviously trying to aim for a really high r squared I'm all going to overfit, without a doubt, okay? Because I'm not, I'm net, I don't know that true value, I just measure somewhere along there. Yet I'm aiming for that high R squared, definitely I'm going to be overfitting, okay? So that's the concept for a relationship between X and Y, but V squared, uh, sorry, PCA holds the same, right? because PCA is just a series of linear regressions. We're doing the same thing. We're going to, if we're aiming for a high R squared with our PCA model, unless we really know the level of error in our raw data, in other words, how accurate is our raw data that we're dealing with, then it's really unwarranted to try and aim for a high R squared. Okay. So don't ever keep adding components until you reach a certain R squared. And unfortunately, I see this all the time, even with companies that sell these software tools and sell courses on this topic that they really should know better. Companies with PhD student uh, people running them, let's say, fit a model until you get 95% R squared. Don't ever do that unless you're really sure your raw data X has is very clean and, and error free. Okay. How should you do this? Or the ideal approach is, is, is what we described earlier. Take some data, keep it aside, between 50 and 25 percent, I'd say. Fit a component to the training data. So you split into testing and training. Take your training data, fit one component to that data set. Project your testing data onto the model. So in other words, bring this testing data set, bring it down onto your existing model, like I showed at the start of this class today. Bring it in, calculate the residuals for that testing data, and then once you've got the residuals, you can calculate the press, prediction error sum of squares, on the testing data. Okay. And 
at some point, you'll get this happening. As you add one component, add the next component, three, four, five, six, your press on the testing data will start to go up. I was just wondering, out of curiosity, um, when you input the, the software that we're using for this course, does it use a metric like this? Because it uses all the data to fit the model, so that auto fit command, how does it actually fit? <laughs> we're going to discuss it right now. Yeah, yeah you're, you're exactly on top of it. Uh, when, yeah, I'll talk about it next. Okay, so this is the ideal approach though. When you've got plenty of data, say thousands of data points, you can easily afford to keep some aside <coughs> and fit a testing data set afterwards and calculate your prediction error sum of squares on your testing data set. And as A goes up and up and up, press will increase, but at some point your prediction error, because you're overfitting, will start to go up again, and that's the point when to stop. Now, most often we don't have the data to keep aside. So, uh, in many cases that's true. Even though we're talking about latent variable methods, which assume you've got lots of data, usually we're meaning lots of columns. But if you're doing experimental work in the lab, um, or you're working on data that's really expensive to obtain, you may not have enough rows to split your data in this 50-50 manner, or even a 75-25% manner. You may not have enough rows to build an accurate or adequate training model if you keep some aside. Okay. So what we do then is we use the concept of cross-validation. And again, cross-validation, what I'm going to show next here, can be applied to any model. You can do it to a least squares model, a neural network model, any model that you, you make, you can apply cross-validation to. So, Let's take a look at what cross-validation is doing. It, we, we, we use it in this particular instance, I'm going to show it to you, in, as a way to avoid overfitting. And that's because we're going to add these components, and at some point, we want to ask, when are the residuals left over here in EA small enough so that there's no information left in them? In other words, we, can, we want to find at what value capital A is it one, two, three, four, five, whenever, should we stop adding capital A so that this part over here, the TP transpose part, or X hat part, contains a summary of the data, and the EA part contains only noise. That's what we're trying to find. At what, at what where do we find that balance, where this is the information in TP transpose and the noise in, in EA, in such a way. So that's our objective here. And let's just quickly recap from, from the previous uh, class. We saw that if I take that relationship, x is equal to x hat plus the residuals, the variance can be decomposed into those three pieces. And the r squared value is nothing more than the variance, or in other words, the sum of squares of the residuals, divided by the sum of squares that we started off with. So if the residuals are really small, that numerator is a small number, divided by some arbitrary model denominator, one minus a small number, you're going to get a high R squared if the residuals are small. We're going to define Q squared as follows. We're going to simply take that same formula, but substitute in the numerator as something different. We're not going to take the variance of the residuals, because remember that's the variance of the data we built the model, the training data. We're going to substitute in that the value for the predicted residuals. Okay. And we're going to calculate that numerator in a special way that I'm going to show next. Okay. So this is quickly to make, make that clear, that numerator, the EA, is a matrix that's enveloped by k columns and represents the residuals after A components. So the key point is that this matrix EA is the same size as the original data set, but now should mostly contain numbers that are zero or close to zero. We're going to simply replace that EA matrix by a different matrix called the predicted EA matrix. And we're going to calculate a matrix with exactly the same shape, 
but in a different way, as follows. So cross-validation works in general using the following principle. Take a data set, X, and split it into G groups, capital G groups. <coughs> in this illustration, I've split it into three groups. So here's rows 1 to 12, and three groups evenly split makes four rows per group. So there's a 1, 1, 1, 1. There's four 1s, four 2s, four 3s. Or you can follow, if you, uh, most of you haven't got the notes in color, uh, so that's why I put the group number there. Okay. So split your data in evenly sized groups, capital G groups, and usually we'll use seven groups, but for this illustration here, I'll just use three. You can order them, though it's preferred that when you decide on the grouping that you just randomly assign them. So don't go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Just randomly choose the rows going into different groups. I'll introduce some new notation. Split that data set now out and collect group one out here. Extract group one, collect that, and we'll call group one x subscript in one in brackets. And so those are the, the rows, the four rows in this particular example from group one. The matrix up here is x minus one. It says it's basically the x matrix with group one rows removed. So that's a, that's a common notation we'll, we'll see in cross validation literature. And we will build our model then on those data. The top data set with group one removed. So we're building our model on a smaller number of rows than what we, that we really had. But we're going to calculate the loadings and the score for that matrix, those eight rows, as our, as our model building data. Then we're going to bring these four rows that we've set aside as testing data, bring them and project them onto the model that we built from x subscript minus 1. So this is our, tra our, our training data, and we've got our model here for that. Bring our testing data in to that model, project it onto that model, calculate x hat 1. Okay. So everyone's clear where x hat 1 comes from. Okay. Obviously, we know x 1. We can calculate the residuals. And that's what I'm going to put in over here. Okay. I'm going to put in there e 1. So I'll copy that residual matrix aside. That's just four rows now. Four rows in this residual matrix in subscript one. Still k columns because I get a residual for every column in the original matrix X. But take those four rows of residuals and paste them and keep them aside in, in memory somewhere. Okay. That's my prediction error for testing group one. Everyone's clear on that. It, this is this is important to understand. So if you if you don't understand, I don't I really don't mind explaining it to you. I'm just wondering why are, are you separating them off again? Okay. The I probably I skipped over that point. Yeah. So originally I said up here the most ideal case is to keep a testing data set aside. So split your data set when you get a, a big data set, say a thousand rows, build your model on on, on 750 rows and keep the 250 rows aside to use as testing data. You use those 250 rows then to calculate the prediction error sum of squares. And then you plot that prediction sum of squares with one component, two components, three components. At some point, prediction error of sum of squares will go up again. And that's the point where you know is the, the number of components that should be supported by this data set. That, that would you be in certain data so that would be more accurate? You could, you could. But usually you're saying that those 750 rows are representative, so the model shouldn't be that much different than if you use 4,000 rows. Okay? But many times we don't have that luxury, so we kind of make an approximation to that, that process that I've just described by using an iterative 
technique called cross-validation, which takes the matrix, splits it into a group here, group one, and groups two, three, four, five, six, and so on, up to capital G, we set aside, and we, we build our model actually on those data. Use group one as testing data, calculate the residuals from those testing data over there, bring that down, uh, sorry, the predictions from those testing data, subtract that from the, the starting values and calculate the residuals for, the, for that group one. We'll copy and paste them over the side, the side into a matrix. Then we repeat the process with group two. So nothing's changed other than we now shuffle our rows around the gate. This time we build the model on group one and three and keep group two aside as testing data. Calculate the predictions for group two, calculate the residuals for group two, and that forms that group of rows. Okay. And then we can repeat it one last time because we've got three groups. So the third time we, we go through this process, we'll calculate the residuals for the third. Group. Why don't we just do this all the time instead of splitting the original? There's a, uh, okay, so Ian's asking why don't we always just use cross-validation instead of um, splitting our data aside. But splitting the data aside is actually a more honest way of calculating the number of components because it's not influenced at all by, um, by the iterative process. You're keeping a true testing data set aside, which really is how you should use your model or will use your model in the future, okay? When we're doing cross-validation, uh, I, I was just about to say after this here, what we go do is after we've calculated this uh, iterative approach, we then, when we present our model to the user, we go and use all the data anyway. But the, a more honest approach is to actually keep a testing data set aside that is never used for anything other than to calculate press. Uh, so cost validation is, a, is, a, is an approximation to that process. So um, coming back to this point, we calculate our residuals for group one, group two, group three. We now have a matrix of residuals where these residuals have been calculated by omitting the rows in X. And every row in X has been omitted and predicted once and only once. That's the key. Okay. So every row has had a chance to contribute to this E matrix E subscript A, which is our, our prediction error sum of squares residual matrix. Okay, and then we just go back and we use that, this matrix here of cross-validated residuals in our numerator, which in this equation has the same structure as R squared, but we're replacing that numerator of what would normally have been the residuals with these predicted residuals. And we'll call that Q squared instead. term that's changed is that numerator term. Okay. So this is the data, all the data, residuals. These are the residuals from when you built the, the model using a cross-validation approach. Okay. This numerator for Q squared, can it ever be lower, that variance of the predicted residuals, can that variance ever be smaller than the variance of the residuals from when you built the model? This variance of the prediction sum of squares should, at the, can at the very minimum equal that, but it will usually be larger. Okay, so you've got a larger numerator over here than over there. By definition, then, or by by extension, then Q squared must be a smaller quantity than R squared. If Q squared happens to approximate a 
approximately, approximately equal to R squared is indicating that you're getting good performance from that component that you've added because you're getting predicted residuals that are roughly in the same order of magnitude or the same, same similar range as the residuals when you built your entire um, PCM. So put, if, if, that, if that reasoning isn't quite apparent to you yet, I see a few kind of confused faces, just compare these two equations side by side and really think what that numerator term means in this equation for R squared and what the numerator means in the equation for Q squared. And it should become apparent that Q squared will always be less than or equal to R squared. And if Q squared is approximately R squared, it implies that component. If Q squared is small, if Q squared is a, is a very small number, then it implies that that component is likely fitting noise. Because your numerator now, your prediction error sum of squares is really large. The large value divided by the large value subtracted from one is going to give you a number close to zero. So a more accurate way of, of stating what I've just put there is we'll calculate Q squared for A is equal to one component. Calculate Q squared for A is equal to two components. Q squared for A is equal to three components. And every time we add a new component, these values will become smaller and smaller. In the same way R squared is smaller and smaller, right? R squared for A is equal to one component is a big number. And then R squared for A is two components is a smaller value. Every time you add a new component, your R squared must decrease. Say Q squared must get must decrease, but eventually your Q squared will go up by only a very small, very minor amount, and that's telling you time to stop adding components. And ignore the top plot for now, but the ProCensus software proceeds as follows. ProCensus uses G is equal to seven. You can read that in their documentation, and in fact, it is an advanced user option that you can change. And for this particular data set. We're seeing the cumulative R squared go up and up, cumulative Q squared going up and up, and auto fit in the ProSensor software to ter terminates after seven components. It says seven components is enough for this data set. Adding an eighth component increases Q squared by a very small amount. So I plotted cumulative Q squared here. Uh, but what I was just describing here earlier was, was the incremental Q squared for every component. So the rule, the rule of thumb used by ProSensus software is once that goes up by, I believe they use, if Q squared only increases by 1% uh, or less, they stop adding a component. They, they're basically saying that additional 1% explained by that additional component is not warranted. Um, they also use a second rule. I calculated Q squared overall for the components, but there's no reason why I can just take this, this equation and apply it to a single column from X. Take the variance of one column of X divided by the press, sorry, the press of one column of X divided by the variance of X. I can calculate Q squared subscript K for the K variable. That. In the same way you can calculate R squared for a variable, you can calculate Q squared for a variable. ProSensus has an additional rule there that says if keep adding components until the Q squared for any variable uh, goes up by 5% or greater, then they'll retain that component. And I'm not sure if both rules have to be met or only one rule has to be met. I think it's if, if either one rule is met, then they will retain that component. So that's auto fit in ProSensus software. It's not the same in every software package. Yep. Just a question on the graph you were talking about. If you look at uh, the third component, yeah. I mean, it's uh, like third to fourth is about like a percent as well. But they they went all the way up to like seven. 
I think the difference between two and three is just greater than one percent. Or if it's not, it's uh, it maybe because one of the other rules have kicked in. The, the Q squared for one of the columns is greater than five percent. That's why it's it's not easy to tell from this block here. Yeah. So you can double check the help file in, in the process software. I believe it's either either rule is met, they will keep adding components. SimkaP, which is another software package on the market, they have a funny way of calculating Q squared that no one seems to be able to figure out. So I put that there just to illustrate that it's not consistent between software packages either. There's no right way of calculating Q squared. R squared is well established and agreed on by everyone. Q squared is not. I mean, Q squared can change by just choosing different groupings of your rows. You'll obviously get a different Q squared value every time you change the, the way you subdivide the matrix. Okay, you'll get a different Q squared. Uh, so there's no consistency with Q squared necessarily. And again, just underscores the fact that you shouldn't rely on auto fit to give you a number of okay, components to use. You should always go back and say, well, does the fourth component really add something to my model? Go look at the scores, go look at the loadings, do they mean something? Um, is that fourth component maybe created due to an outlier? Uh, you re really can't just rely on these automated algorithms to give you a correct answer. And as we started the class off with, I was trying to emphasize the point that there isn't always one correct answer. You yourself saw that you could fit a linear, a quadratic, or a cubic model to the same data set and get good, good enough answers. So even from that point of view, you can't always say how many components you fit. So this was a big area of research for a period of time. Um, people do still come back to it um, as a research topic, though. Like right now, what's, what's in, what people are trying to look at are resampling methods. I won't talk about that in this class, but uh, if you're interested in that, I can send you some papers on that. Uh, my, my key point is always put a few extra components beyond what the software is telling you, and if they mean anything to you, keep them. There's no reason why you have to believe auto okay. Was there, Ian, did you have another question? Before I move on, any, any issues? Yeah. Are you what, essentially, is this cross validation essentially trying to see when your when your error error becomes not correlated to your data anymore? Is that kind of what you're trying to see when your your error doesn't predict it doesn't have any variance related to your error? Okay, so your errors are always uncorrelated to your data by definition they are following on to the data set. Uh, but I think what you're asking is when is there no structure linked to your error? Is, might that be what you're getting at? Or? Yeah, like convention, like say you're just doing a, uh, like a, what, what, we, what we learn in undergrad, like you fit a linear, something linear, and then we see some sort of pattern in our residuals, right. and we'll say, okay, that's a bad thing. Yeah, there's still so sort of, the rule is uh, for like for these questions, if as long as you see any structure in your residuals, yeah. it's indicating that sure you should go ahead and add a term to try and capture the, that structure, so that after adding that term, your residuals now have no structure left over. Okay, so in in this you can use I guess the equivalent of that PCA would be to go examine SPE to make sure that there's, your SPE doesn't show really large values. Um, the other thing to see it as is that residual matrix that we calculated up here, that e, EA compress, if there is structure in that matrix, okay, then this will be really large. So that's why the press comes down, because it originally there is structure left over. It would be the equivalent of me, if I just fit one component to my model, uh, it would be the equivalent of fitting a horizontal line. That's a, a, a model with one component. The residuals are clearly have some structure left over there. I fit the second component, and there's, uh, there's much less structure left over in the third and the fourth. When I bring my testing data in, if I fit a linear model now to my testing data, 
there's still structure in my residuals for the testing points. If I fill a, 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 a line with the slope now, there's much less structure left in it. And then same for a, a linear and a cubic, a uh, quadratic, sorry. The moment I fill a cubic point through that data, like um, that model, that those residual distances start to go up again. So my residuals become smaller and smaller and smaller, and as I add complexity, those residuals get, grow bigger and bigger again. Okay, so see it from that point of view rather than no structure. You want to find the point at which you've got minimum structure left over the residuals. In this, sorry, in, in EA press would be a, a better way to say it. 